things started to get messy. The trouble with Zopiclone, the trouble with all benzos actually, is that they utterly pile drive your short term memory. Things kept disappearing. I'd put something down like my phone or my iPod and when I went to pick it up again it was in the bathroom. I had no idea how dangerous it is to mix hefty amounts of benzos with hefty amounts of alcohol, let alone on top of my methadone script. And then glitch. One moment I was looking at a red apple in my hand. In the air-conditioned supermarket, tanned people bustling everywhere. Then the next thing I knew, I was waking up. Somewhere else. Somewhere wrong. So hello YouTube, and welcome back to another chapter of The Nostalgia Project, Volume 2. <laughs> If you're ever interested in reading these stories, the first volume is now out as a book with a really pretty cover. <laughs> Link below, or if you prefer hearing them. <laughs> the playlist is also down there. Today's story is really two stories. Ones you've asked me for time and time again. Firstly, how I got my autism diagnosis, given it was a bit of a weird one. And secondly, the Spain story. Many years ago I mentioned the Spain story but didn't tell you the full grisly tale and for some odd reason it's stuck in so many people's brains like a fish hook that even now, almost a decade later, I still get asked, what's the Spain story? Are we ever going to hear it? So with typical ADHD organisational skills here in nearly 2023, you're finally getting it. I hope it lives up to expectations. Last time we were here telling stories, it was about the overdose disaster. The fact that back in 09, I'd gotten hooked on heroin and now everyone knew it because my dumb ass had gone and overdosed, requiring a full week in hospital. Although the ironic caveat here is that the substance I OD'd on wasn't actually heroin. Everything happened because I didn't have heroin and when the anxiety drove me crazy I took something else and the shit fried my liver, which is a little bit of a theme that's going to continue throughout this story too. <sighs> when I got out of hospital, nothing had changed. All my problems were still there waiting. I was still an addict and still totally unable to manage the anxiety that had come crashing down on my head three months earlier when I'd thrown myself full force into the adult world only to have it grind me up like fucking kebab meat and spit me straight back out again. I was living back home, too crazy to even work part time and the only way I could stand to keep on breathing instead of flinging myself off the top of a multi-storey car park mid panic attack was to self-medicate with heroin. But there was one good thing that came from all this terrible crap, and that was story number one. The fact that my autism was finally, at the grand age of 24, picked up on when I met Dr. M. See, if you're an injecting drug addict, you have to go to needle exchanges quite a lot. And my needle exchange was tied to the Pacific Addiction Clinic. And the great thing about that was that when you're an addict who's newly crippled with anxiety and falling to bits every five seconds, you walk into a drug centre, fall to pieces, and miracle of miracles, they actually help you. Or to be more accurate, they did help you. Because this was 2009, the fucking Tories hadn't seized power yet, and therefore mental health services hadn't gone 110% further down the shitter. Back in 2009, drug services ran like a smoothly oiled machine, and my mind was blown. I'd been in ED services and general mental health services, and they'd all been bloody terrible, non-existent. But drug services were genuinely brilliant under a Labour government. There was art therapy, acupuncture, tons of different therapies and psychological treatments available, plus workers who knew their shit and actually cared. The degree to which I've watched the Tories strip that place to the bone now is tragic, but we'll leave that rant for now. We're still back in 09 when things were good. And soon enough, I met Dr. M, 
the psychiatrist who would finally, finally understand me. She was a middle-aged woman with an undefinable foreign accent, a pronounced limp, piercing black eyes, and an attitude like a gruff, snappy bulldog. Honestly, she was terrifying, but I rapidly realised that wasn't the thing that mattered. What mattered was that she was the first decent psychiatrist I'd run into in my entire life. The fact that in 24 years on this planet, no one had picked up on either my autism or my ADHD. All this was, at its heart, the reason for my nervous breakdown. I had no clue that I had any form of disability. So I believed the lie the neurotypical world fed me. That I was just lazy. That there was no excuse, no reason for me to struggle. You're so intelligent. You could do anything. You could do everything. You just have to try harder. So I forced myself into that tiny neurotypical box that I was never made to fit into, kept running on a broken leg, and it crippled me forever. I guess I'd managed to mask fairly well until then, crushing down my emotions, turning the stress and anger inward, self-harming and starving and shooting up every drug under the sun. I was like a dysfunctional swan gliding along on top of the water, no one able to see the frantic splashing chaos that kept me afloat and moving. My history, these stories... They're honestly nothing more than a poster child tome for undiagnosed neurodivergence of my era. As so many of you tell me, really, so many of you relating and saying, oh my god, this was me growing up too. These stories are not unique in any kind of way. This is just what happens when you don't diagnose someone and you expect the impossible of them for years and decades. Depression, self-harm, eating disorders, anxiety, addiction, and all that without ever being diagnosed with a single root cause. Doctors never seemed to question back then the fact that you could have so many fucking problems. And maybe, maybe there was something underlying them? No, 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 didn't occur. So when Dr. M said, I think you have Asperger's, I want to do a diagnostic test on you, I basically laughed in her face and told her to fuck off. Because autism or Asperger's as it was back then was something that had never had a place in my world. I knew nothing about it, bar some bizarre Y2K era cliches about the condition. The Aspies were weird as all hell, like totally socially awkward. And above all, they couldn't read nonverbal cues. Not one bit, they may as well be blind. And that's why they were so utterly outstandingly weird. Now me, being an egotistical, arrogant little 24-year-old Aries, well, there was no way in hell I was entertaining the notion that I might be weird, as in socially inept. And besides, I could read nonverbal cues just fine. Or so I thought. I mean, how do you know when you've only ever been you? What on earth is your point of comparison? I'm fully aware these days that a lot of nonverbal communication falls through the cracks with me, but I'm not blind to nonverbal stuff. This being so, I refuse to be diagnosed. But it's like I said, Dr. M was a bulldog. She wasn't dropping it. As my unstoppable anxiety raged on, she tried me on medication after medication and it did nothing at all, and I carried on clinging to heroin as my only temporary respite from the anxiety hell, until with a knowing glint in her sharp black eyes, Dr. M signed me off a prescription for Risperdal. I went home, ate the first pill at bedtime, and it was a miracle. As I lay in bed, heart pounding away just like it had been pounding for months straight at this point, all of a sudden... It just switched off. The anxiety that had been crushing me from the chest outwards for months now was just gone. I didn't even feel weird or sedated or emotionally numb like I had on other meds they'd tried me on. I just felt calm, normal, myself again, like a genuine fucking miracle. And when I went back to Dr. M and told her everything, she smiled this victorious smile and informed me as though pulling a rather smug white rabbit out of her hat, that it wasn't actually an anxiety med she'd given me. It was a medication used in the treatment back then of autism. So the fact it worked on me was interesting. Did I fancy that diagnostic test yet? No, I said, I'm not weird. <laughs> 
But the bulldogish doctor poked and prodded and in the end I caved to shut her up as much as anything. I was convinced the test would prove that I was neurotypical and that would be that, but obviously it went the other way. I was officially diagnostically autistic. You don't have to tell anyone if you don't want to, said Dr. M. I know and you know, that's all that matters. Laughably, I was still convinced that she was wrong, that it was all just bullshit. I pushed the whole thing to the back of my brain and more or less forgot about it, which was precisely how things would stay for another year at least, until I read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and discovered that autistic people could, in fact, be cool and badass and damn near superpowered. And that idea resonated with me far better than the incorrect assumption that autism made you a socially isolated weirdo who couldn't read body language. I fell eternally in love with Lisbeth Salander to the point of going directly to the hairdressers and having my long blonde hair hacked off and dyed black to be more like her, and I've never grown it out since. But the Spain story... That was still to come. Though I was now under the care of the Pacific Addiction Clinic, prescribed methadone, and they now had my anxiety under control, I was still largely chucking that methadone in the closet and using heroin instead. Of course I was. I had been an addict long before the anxiety came along. Just because I didn't need heroin to keep me sane anymore didn't mean I didn't need it in other ways. So the addiction wore on, my love for junk and the needle deepening and thickening until we were irrevocably intertwined. The physical aspect of addiction wasn't an issue. I always had that methadone stash if I needed it, but the mental, emotional, habitual addiction had utterly taken me over. Somehow, though, this unfortunate fact was not something I took into account as a potential issue when in September I decided to spend a while in Spain with my dad. Spain isn't really a big adventure for me. This vacation was meant to be a small, delicate test run of my abilities to travel since the nervous breakdown. My dad's had a place out there since before I was even born, right on the seafront, the living room window full of nothing but sea and sky, ocean breezes ripping through the apartment block like natural aircon, Everything scented with driftwood and sunshine. At the back of the property sits a big, beautiful swimming pool. And given my dad's the only Brit in the building, during the day most people are at work, which meant the swimming pool would always be mine to splash about in. Doing handstands and somersaults under the water, the Spanish sun beating down and the blue, blue water rippling beneath it. Sunlight and water combined make me happier than almost anything on earth. I have no fucking clue why I still live in this shithole of a country where the sky is always grey and the only swimming you can do is indoors and the Tories, Tories, Tories have eroded everything our nation depends on until we're on the verge of a general fucking strike and plan power cuts like this is the bleakest bit of the 1970s all over again but there we go with another depressing tangent I guess. When I set off for Spain... I didn't bring any heroin with me. That's the first thing to say. Honestly, I'm not sure why I didn't. Given that only a few years previously I'd snuck a wrap of speed out to Amsterdam, but perhaps by the age of 24 I had finally realised that international drug smuggling was not something you fucked with lightly or preferably at all. I didn't even bring weed with me. All I had was my methadone, complete with a letter from Pacific explaining that it was fully legal, and I also had two weeks' worth of Zopiclone sleeping pills, courtesy of my GP, after I'd explained that I'd smoked weed to get to sleep every night since the age of 16, and now that I was going abroad, there was no way I'd be able to sleep without it. My GP was totally ace, completely understanding. She gave me the pills. I was a bit of a git about it though. I told her I was going for two weeks or so when in fact I was only off for about four days. I just fancied having some extra. There are always limits I guess when it comes to trusting a junkie. My dad flew out from Gatwick a day or two before I made my flight from Birmingham International, mooching round the brightly lit shopping halls and buying myself a red apple shaped bottle of hypnotic poison perfume and a little Mac eyeshadow palette, then making my way through security and onto the plane. 
That first night, everything seemed fine. I got there late and exhausted, and I'd done some heroin and smoked some weed earlier that day, so I was on an even keel. We had a quick tea, a couple of brandies, then I went to bed and slept without a hitch. In the morning, I did my usual Spain thing. Hours splashing around in the pool, sunbathing, then a leisurely stroll through the sunlit market at the back of the apartment blocks and up the heat-quivering road to the supermarket for a few basic essentials. Then I had a pot around the large semi-indoor market where there were bookstalls and that rather nauseating mid-2000s trend for having your feet nibbled smooth by a tank full of tiny skin-eating fish. Does anyone else remember this? I did not partake but idly watched as sunburned Brits abroad sat reading their trash mags while swarms of tiny fish swirled around their toughened brown feet gobbling up all that horrible old skin. Like genuinely this was a huge trend. Mm -mm. <laughs> In the afternoon we walked the 50 yards to the beach and I reread Harry Potter between bouts of bobbing about in the water, the scents of suntan cream and salt and sunshine swirling around us small children waddling about the place with buckets and spades. When it got dark, we headed out for gigantic cocktails and a restaurant meal, then my dad's lifelong obsession with karaoke. Dad's area in Spain is rammed with karaoke bars, and he can happily sing all night. I tried it once, seeking his approval as much as anything, but I nearly puked with anxiety and never ever tried karaoke again, bar once, at this eating disorder meetup in 2007, where about nine of us crammed into this dark little Japanese karaoke booth in Soho, fueled ourselves with vodka and cocaine, and hollered along en masse to everything from Smells Like Teen Spirit to the Spice Girls. That karaoke was so much fun, but my dad likes it traditional. You know, the get up on stage completely alone, everyone eyeballing you like it's the fucking X Factor stuff. Way too intimidating for me. But they pour the drink strong and I had my iPod, so I just got wasted and put my earphones in then lost myself to drunkenly stimming along to music from my raver era, which made me look completely mental. But I was too drunk to care and my dad was too busy singing to notice... I think. I don't remember now whether it was this second night or the third that things started to get messy. Was it an instant switch up or a slowly rolling clusterfuck? I genuinely don't know. But either way, when bedtime came, it was rapidly apparent that sleep was not going to accompany it. At home, my bedtime routine consisted of a strong shot of smack, then I'd nod out over half a pre-rolled joint and fumble my way to bed. It was genuinely my favourite part of the fucking day. I was always in bed by 10pm on the dot as a smackhead, despite previously being a night owl, because when going to bed is accompanied by a great big shot of smack, it's rarely something you push back just to watch a bit more telly. There is genuinely no show on earth able to compete with heroin, is there? Weirdly though, my parents never seem to see this as an odd thing or a warning sign. A 24-year-old with the rigid early night bedtime habits of a particularly lethargic OAP. But anyway, after my junk and a joint bedtime supper, at home I slept perfectly. So fucking sedated, I would literally have bruised patches on the backs of my heels from lying completely motionless all night long, not tossing and turning one bit. And without that, the heroin, the weed, my body straight up didn't know what to do with itself. Sleeping sober? What? What the fuck do you mean? The body machine could not compute the equation. I had the Zopiclone with me, of course, but I quickly discovered that after all that dope, Zopiclone did not even touch the sides. So, at this point, I did exactly what every junkie does when they don't have their drug of choice, but they do have a drug. I took another one. The trouble with Zopiclone, the trouble with all benzos actually, is that they utterly pile drive your short term memory. So when I say I took another one, what I really mean is I went on an all night binge and didn't even know it was happening. 
I was just on a loop now. Take a pill, lie down, fail to sleep, curse under my breath, take another pill, repeat, repeat, repeat. I wasn't keeping track, keeping count of the pills I'd consumed. For some godforsaken idiot reason, I was also attempting to fall asleep with my iPod playing, out of sheer boredom I guess, but my iPod contained zero relaxing music. And pretty soon, between all those pills and all those ravey tunes, I started feeling interesting. Sort of floaty, not quite real. Things kept disappearing. I'd put something down, like my phone or my iPod, and when I went to pick it up again, it was in the bathroom or in my handbag, though I never remembered having gone there. So I lay back down and tried once more to sleep, and it was boring, boring, and sleep never came. I could hear and smell the night outside, those temptingly warm, balmy Spanish nights where no one can really sleep, and the oceans crashing rhythmically just beyond the windows, and people are laughing out in the darkness on the seafront. It didn't feel like a time for sleep, this non-stop party city. <laughs> And more than that, I missed it so goddamn badly. My mouth yearned for the filthy burn of rolled up weed and tobacco, and this craving was amplified a thousandfold in the frustrated ache of my veins for the prick and sting of a needle filled with the fresh, hot, golden brown nectar of late 2000s heroin, long before fentanyl came along and dirtied the whole thing up, stripping that stunning honey bark colour to a pasty piss yellow nothing. I thought about heroin and heroin and heroin. Inches away from ripping out my hair and screaming till I lost my voice, the cravings were that unrelenting. I couldn't sleep to save my fucking soul, so I snuck out into the main room of the apartment and started downing brandies in the hope they'd knock me out. I had no idea how dangerous it is to mix hefty amounts of benzos with hefty amounts of alcohol, let alone on top of my methadone script, but frankly, even if I had known, I probably wouldn't have cared. I wanted to be knocked out, didn't I? I was trying to sleep. If it ended in a coma, surely that was a 50% success rate to my tired, addled brain. Anyway, I drank the brandy, and as alcohol always does, it made me even more desperate to smoke something. I had no weed, but I had bought a pack of Luckies the day before anticipating this craving, even though I had no clue how or where I was going to smoke them without my dad losing his shit. No one in my family smokes. It's every bit as verboten as heroin, frankly. If I lit up a cigarette in their presence, they'd probably stage an intervention. I didn't even smoke cigarettes, not unless it was a social thing, but like most Europeans, I rolled tobacco with my weed, and maybe the reckless addition of disgusting nicotine to marijuana explains the intensity of my cravings to smoke at that point. Anyway, everything had become very, very hazy by now, and sleep still eluded me. So I got out a cigarette and a lighter, and still carrying my latest brandy, I decided I'd go and smoke in the only damn place I could without my dad losing it, the back corridor of the apartment block. So out I went with no shoes on, still in my skimpy pink Primark pyjamas, clutching nothing but a cig, lighter and a tumbler of brandy. Then I sat on the cool tiled floor of the corridor and smoked half that noxious thing, blowing smoke through the petal-shaped vents before eventually giving up in disappointment and disgust. My brain knew this cigarette was not a joint. It tasted wrong, it felt wrong in my mouth, and above all, it didn't have the desired effect, making me dizzy and mildly nauseous instead of sleepy. Who the fuck had made cigarettes a billion dollar industry? They were horrible and pointless. Who wants to die over a drug that doesn't even get you high? This has baffled me about cigarettes all my life. Irritably, I stubbed it out, blew the ash through the lower holes in the wall, then tried to get back into the flat, only to realise the door had closed, locking me out, and I had no keys with me. In my state of benzo-doped, adult-brained incompetence, I did the only thing that seemed logical. I rang the doorbell. Dad appeared a few moments later with the ruffled, startled look of someone who's just had their doorbell go off at fuck-off o'clock in the morning, 
finding me on the doorstep with no shoes on and a glass of brandy, he asked what on earth I was doing out there, to which I had no decent answer. I was hardly looking at the sea, was I? It was in the opposite direction. Do you know what time it is? He asked, flabbergasted, and I did not. It turned out to be round 5am. Sorry, I mumbled, couldn't sleep. He let me in and I went back to my room, cravings wholly unsatisfied, sleep still unattainable, and took another bloody zopiglone. At this point, I was convinced the pills were doing literally nothing. But that maybe if I took enough, I would actually be knocked out the way I was used to. You know, with heroin. And after this, the timeline gets a little bit fuzzy. Like one of those creepy cute tropical caterpillars. You can't work out which end is the front and which end is the back, but you know it's a vividly weird creature. I have no idea if I got up and swam in the morning in that state, but in all likelihood, I did. I couldn't sleep, so what the fuck else was I going to do bar risk drowning myself in a benzo stupor under the gorgeous great heat lamp of the Spanish sun? And when Dad decided we needed a proper food shopping expedition, I chose to come too, which in retrospect was a really bad idea. If you've just ingested what turns out to be at least seven Zopiclone tablets in a single night and your parents are about, I do not recommend you hang out with them. Frankly, I do not recommend you go out in public at all. I thought everything was fine though, genuinely. I didn't even realise the benzos were still affecting me until I was mid-conversation with my dad and he roughly launched forwards, grabbed me by one arm and yanked me sideways like a fucking rag doll, yelling, are you crazy? I just stepped out directly in front of a speeding bus. I hadn't even clocked the fact it was the road we were walking into. Oops. I think at that point he asked if there was something wrong with me. I told him I got no sleep last night, which wasn't a lie, was it? We made it to the supermarket without further disasters and began gathering our usual lunch supplies, the bread, the lettuce, the cheese. I decided I wanted some apples and started picking them out of the box, checking them over, bagging them up, and then... Glitch. One moment, I was looking at a red apple in my hand. In the air-conditioned supermarket, tanned people bustling everywhere. Then the next thing I knew, I was waking up. Somewhere else. Somewhere wrong. It took me a minute to identify it as Dad's bed. I was on top of the duvet, fully clothed, and there were still shoes on my feet. Dad was in the next room on his computer. And you know what? I was still too full of Zopiclone to register any fucking embarrassment or to even wonder what might have happened between the apples and the waking up. Did I say anything, do anything completely ridiculous while I was running on total blackout autopilot? Had I gone for a nap with dignity, or had I sat on the edge of the bed and slowly, slurrily nodded out into a snoring, doped-up heap? I have a horrible feeling all signs point to the latter. The rest of that day was, I believe, though I concede to being a profoundly unreliable narrator when it comes to the day in question, fairly uneventful. We did the beach, the restaurants, the karaoke, maybe even some crazy golf, and I seemed to be mending my dented reputation. But when bedtime came, the same fucking shit happened. I couldn't sleep. I could not fucking sleep. No matter what I did, I munched Zopiclone like fucking Smarties, posted a line of totally incoherent consonants to Facebook and skulked around my room drinking brandy and listening to music and being bored until around 9am when my dad got up and I, with perfectly ironic timing, finally passed out. Sort of. The Zopiclone seemed to enable me to sleep only in intervals of roughly 15 minutes. And for this entire duration, my knocked out body would be speaking aloud at a considerable volume. I know this because it was my own damn speech that woke me up every time. 
literally I was like just waking up and then I'd hear this and it would wake me up and it would be me speaking in my sleep like you know in in kind of really like doped up voice Uh, when I finally emerged from the bedroom dad asked me with a decidedly dubious look who I'd been speaking to in there I was just talking in my sleep I told him with a forced laugh super weird I actually woke myself up talking Again, it wasn't a lie, but it did make me so uncomfortable I had to go and hide out in the bathroom while trying to remember what the fuck I'd been dreaming about as to what the fuck I might have just said out loud. I quickly came to the ugly conclusion that you didn't have to be a genius to work out what I must have said. My every thought was fixated on the heroin I didn't have. If you've ever been an addict without your substance of choice you'll know you dream about it incessantly. Particularly scoring or preparing the drug, then you wake up just before you get the satisfaction of using it because brains are bastards and addicts' dreams are the ultimate cocktees. My conscious and subconscious were sharpened into a lethal fixation. There's no way I was talking about anything other than dope. Finally, I remembered that one of the times I woke myself up talking, I'd done so believing I was on the phone to my dealer. So that right there is what my dad heard. Me having a particularly surreal, semi-conscious conversation with an imaginary heroin dealer. Not ideal. Not fucking ideal at all. And finally he broached the subject over cocktails in the evening that had I been on something the other day when I nearly threw myself under a bus. I told him it was prescription pills from my doctor, which again was no word of a lie, but I could hardly tell him the whole truth, could I? And it drives me insane that I couldn't, that some drugs are stigmatised while many other far more dangerous drugs are absolutely fine to chat to your parents about. Because the thing was, it was exactly the same as the sodding overdose, wasn't it? It wasn't illegal drugs, but the lack of illegal drugs that caused all my problems. Before I'd come here, I'd been using heroin and weed every single day. And as dubious as that is, I was a perfectly functional person on it. I'd gone back into education and was starting my college access course to allow me to begin an English degree the following September. Every night I slept like a drugged baby and every day I woke up feeling fine. Heroin was a functional fucking drug for me. But it was illegal, wasn't it? About the most illegal and stigmatised drug going. So instead of being fine and functional, I'd had to leave everything I needed back home and come out here with this packet of totally untested, utterly ineffectual prescription pills. And because of that stupid fucking flaw in the legal system, I'd now made a raging tit of myself in front of my dad and it wasn't going away. The Spain incident would make him suspicious of my every move for the rest of my life, literally. To this very day, well over a decade later, he's convinced I'm on some kind of terrible drug even when I'm not. If I seem quiet, I must be on drugs. If I'm perky, I'm definitely on drugs. There's just no winning with the guy and I genuinely feel like he avoids me as a result. Which is a really shitty reward for being more or less sober now. That vacation, that lack of heroin, it threw an almighty spanner into the works of our relationship forever. I'd originally flown out there with an open-ended ticket, planning to stay a full week, maybe longer, wanting the flexibility. In the end, though, I bailed as soon as I possibly could, sleep-deprived to the nth degree. On our final night, we walked all the way up to the old town, sat down in a Chinese restaurant and ordered food, only for me to have to leave because I felt so nauseous and wiped out. Dad said I looked tearful. I wasn't at all. My eyes were just fried from being open for days on end, but either way, it left him eating his meals solo with plenty of time to wonder and surmise what the fuck was going on with me. Terrible drugs was the conclusion he clearly reached, and I guess he wasn't exactly wrong. I was an addict, but it irks the 
fuck out of me that this permanent stain on our relationship came about not through reckless overuse, but through shittily enforced sobriety. The very second I got home, I pounced on the heroin and the weed and slept for four straight hours before taking a shower, slapping on some makeup and heading out to score more gear on the way to Eddie's to see a Ramones tribute band who were awesome. Um, that's the difference it made. Heroin, weed, these illegal vilified substances, one little shot, one little joint and I could get the sleep I desperately needed, then click straight back into functional life. I fully understand the fact that heroin gets a bad rap because many people cannot function on it, but I always wonder how much of that is down to misinformation and a chronic lack of drug education presented to the general public. Just hear me out for a minute, all right? If you're middle class like me, you undoubtedly grew up knowing that heroin was a bad idea. You probably grew up knowing all about withdrawal and the fact that you never want to fucking go through it. Heroin honestly is a joke of a drug to the middle class because it's something so infamously stupid you'd never touch it with a barge pole. Unless you're me, of course, with my penchant for stupid ideas and bad coping strategies. But all this, it's not the case for everyone. In 2010, I came to know a fellow addict, this thin, twitchy, undiagnosed ADHD case just like me. When he told me his addiction story, it shocked me speechless. He'd grown up in an impoverished area and heroin was so normal around there, it was just a thing people took. But no one ever bothered educating the kids about what it really did, what it really meant. So he got into weed and booze, just like literally every other British teenager. And then he tried out smoking some gear too, because it was there and a drug was a drug, right? And it turned out he kind of liked it. Did it now and then, now and then, until after a particularly heavy weekend, he got sick as a fucking dog. He'd never felt anything like it. I had to phone up his dealer telling the guy there was something wrong with this batch. Don't give it to anyone else, man. It's fucking me up hardcore. That was his main concern. Other people. This dodgy batch. But his dealer just laughed. Told him to calm down. You're rattling, that's all. You need some more and then you'll be fine. Happens to everyone in the end. And that was it. He was a full-on heroin addict. And he didn't even know it could happen. This is literally what the war on drugs fucking creates. Instead of legalising, controlling and taxing drugs, then funneling that money into educating people on how to use safely, if they must use at all, or to creating schemes that prescribe clean, dose-measured heroin to existing addicts, which, by the way, is an idea that has succeeded with flying fucking colours every single time it's been trialled. Instead, the general public is left with zero reliable information on drug use, meaning that impressionable working class kids get dragged into nightmarish situations they never had the first clue they were stepping into and the people who become addicts you know the ones who are mentally ill and suffering and lonely all the things that drive a person to drugs in the first place they're not helped even when they turn up in hospitals ODing they're branded drug seekers if they try to get anything legally, they're locked in prisons if anyone catches them with a pocket full of the only thing that's keeping them from topping themselves, and the government does not give a shit. The war on drugs is a war on people, is the ultimate summary quote I've ever seen. Though personally, I'd say the war on drugs is more specifically a war on the poor and the mentally ill. Two subgroups, the Tory and Republican Party, seem bent on wiping out completely. Remember that drug centre I was telling you about, the Pacific Addiction Clinic? The one with the art therapy, acupuncture and a range of other therapies provided to addicts for free, yeah? Well, now we've had the Tories since 20 fucking 10, that place has scrapped every single form of therapy and now provides zero psychological treatments. Addiction is classified as a mental illness, Yet, in a government-funded treatment centre, you will not be provided mental health care of any kind. You'll still get your methadone or bup, thank God, but as far as actually treating you, working out what's going on beneath the self-medication, 
they don't give a flying fuck. And like I say, they still expect you to get clean. They genuinely expect it to work, treating the withdrawal but not the addiction itself. It's exactly akin to telling an anorexic that eating a cheeseburger will fix them forever. No other work needed. And the drug workers who used to care, they're all gone now. They had to go for their own fucking sanity. I've watched them time and time again. I can see a nervous breakdown coming a mile off in a drug worker. The ones that care, they don't last now. They can't. How can you see a person suffering and care, wanting desperately to help, but then have to keep on telling them, no, sorry, we don't help people here. There isn't the funding. It's not what we're about. You're on your own. These poor souls are on the front line between the bastard Tories and the suffering addicts who sob, I am literally about to kill myself if someone doesn't help me. And there's nothing, nothing they can do. So whether that addict offs themselves now or in another 10 years, it's more than their heart can take. They quit, one after another. Drug work is reserved now for hardened souls who don't give a fuck or it's a revolving door occupation, breaking caring souls within a six month period. Whether you're a worker or an addict, it's a fucking disaster. So there you have it, the quandary the multi-way mirror. Do I blame drugs for all my problems the way most people would? Or do I blame the war on drugs and the way that the illegal status and stigma pushed me into so many stupid, awful corners? I'd overdosed when I couldn't get drugs. I'd nearly been killed by a speeding bus when I couldn't get drugs. And now I'd wrecked my relationship with my dad for the exact same reason. And I could understand simply blaming drugs as one huge umbrella term if it weren't for the awkward fact that, like, say, I was a functional junkie. When I had heroin, I attended uni, handed my essays in on time, went to social events, got along fine with my family. It was cheap as chips back then, too, gear. So I wasn't even doing anything crazy to afford my habit. There were literally no downsides to my addiction besides the illegality. The risk of prison, the risk of bad cuts and unknown doses, and of course the fact that illegal drugs cannot be taken overseas, causing this whole shit show. If you haven't already read the studies done on prescribing clean heroin to addicts, you really should. The findings are startling. Heroin doesn't have to be a big bad bastard of a drug. Banning it has made it that way. Look at all the fentanyl deaths in the US, all of which could have been prevented by giving prescribed heroin to addicts in monitored injection rooms, many of which things have been trialled here and in other places in Europe. And it works, but they don't care. But anyway, we've strayed far, far into the land of idealism now. The war on drugs does rage on, and for my 2010 self... Things were only about to get so much worse. I've told you about my experience with injection roulette. That story is below if you're interested. About the dumbest thing I ever injected and nearly died. But I still haven't told you about hands down the most revolting, unbelievably unsafe thing I ever did due to my addiction. Next time... Because 2010 was, like I said, a swinging polarity of a year, heaven and hell combined. It was a brand new decade. Goth had just come back into fashion. I'd re-entered education, prepping for university. And then my functional junkie world came crashing right the fuck down. That's where we're leaving it for this one. So yes, that is the Spain story at last. I can't remember now um, in what context I alluded to the Spain story many, many, many years ago. Um, probably in the context of like, yeah, the, this, is, this is like the, the, the big awkward thing between me and my dad is, is the Spain story. And um, yeah, the, this is basically it. The, the, yes, when I was a massive raging addict, I went out to Spain. I couldn't bring what I needed. So I had Zopiclone to help me sleep. And um, Zopiclone, if you don't know, is is a benzo kind of similar to Xanax, but a bit more 
are no surreal and floaty because it makes you sleep. But if you don't fall asleep, it gets surreal and floaty and I couldn't sleep. And I just kept eating the things. And I <laughs> I made I mean, I made a video years and years and years and years, years ago about Xanax and how I found it so bizarre that it's become this this trendy thing for rappers to rap about. Because my experience with Xanax is quite limited, but I, I seem to have this thing when it comes to benzos that they, they don't last long on me or I don't feel them for long. And I think they've worn off completely. So I take another one. So my main experience with Xanax was when I ate 17 bars in a single night or a single weekend. I don't know because I blacked out for two days, so I don't know when I took them. I just know I counted afterwards and there were 17 gone. <laughs> so... um yeah, it's not. It's not good. Me, me and Benzo is not not a good combination because they, I don't feel like they're working, so I take more and then I lose days. Or, yeah, I can't really narrate the Spain story particularly well because obviously I was blacked out for a good deal of it. So, um, yeah, quite how embarrassing I was is unknown to me. But yeah, the the sleep talking thing was awful. Like I, I would wake myself up just going. Blah, 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 blah. And I would have to think, what what was I dreaming about? So what was I saying? And like, say, addict dreams. If you've ever been an addict or an eating disordered person too, if you've ever been bulimic, I bet you've had the binging dreams or the going shopping to buy binge food dreams. You know, you you have these dreams about preparing your drug of choice, whether that's food, whether that's a drug, what whatever it is, you, you have dreams about getting it, preparing it. And you always wake up before you get the satisfaction. So I'm pretty sure my dad heard me talking in my sleep to some kind of like imaginary dealer who I thought was on the phone to me or something because that was the kind of dream I was having. So uh, quite humiliating all in all probably explains why we don't talk much now and why my dad every time we do talk then talks to my mum afterwards and wonders whether I'm on terrible drugs because yes if I'm quiet oh must be on terrible drugs most of the time though I'm, I'm happy to talk to him it's nice to talk for once so I talk and I'm, I'm you know I'm a chatterbox I talk fast so he always thinks I'm on something and it's like no that that's that's just my personality that's just <laughs> you know what the fuck can I do about that so it's like I, I've, I now feel like every time I'm speaking to my dad on the phone it's like I don't know, should, should I try and do some kind of like neurotypical acting or something? Like how how does one act like one is sober when one's general personality is is, is a bit whack anyway? <laughs> like, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to act sober because like, like I think I said in, in the video about my ADHD diagnosis, um, people used to think I was more sober when I was on drugs and then when I quit drugs that was when I used to get a lot of comments about what are you on and it was like well ADHD is what I'm on but I didn't know that because I only got diagnosed with that this year so um I didn't know I didn't know why it was that I seemed more whacked out when I was sober <sighs> so uh yeah my life is one long humiliation thank you for uh treading beside me for it so uh yes as I said at the beginning the book of volume one stories is out now it is called millennium gothic it is on amazon should you fancy seeking it out the cover is fucking beautiful and i love it um so that is out if you fancy reading these stories as a book the first volume of them anyway and uh, if you would rather just listen to some more there is a playlist below if you don't want to be interrupted by adverts and all of that then you could become a wonderful patreon person for two dollars that link is also below and with all of that pimping done <laughs> i will shut the fuck up and leave you alone because this is quite a long video so uh, thank you for tolerating my gigantic waffle now you know how i humiliated myself in spain and next time we will be talking about 2010 and addict life and yes the hands down the most the most revolting thing i ever did as an addict and how it didn't kill me i i don't know it didn't even send me to hospital and it was gross dude it was gross so uh that's what we'll be talking about next time so um if you fancy subscribing or becoming a Patreon person, that is always welcome. If not, I will hope the algorithm brings us back together. So uh, with all of that said, thank you for tolerating my waffle. I'm going to go away now. Over and out. Bye-bye. <laughs>